Hello, Namaste, and welcome to Delhi. I'm Divina Gupta, and this is Work Life India on the BBC, the show that looks at all things to do with money, the work we do, and the lives we lead. Now, the world's second most populous country is faced with a severe water crisis. According to a government think tank, 21 of India's major cities are at the risk of running out of groundwater as soon as next year. Some experts contest that, but in places like the southern city of Chennai, the worst is already here. Residents there have to queue up to fill their pots from rationed government water services. Hospitals, schools and hotels are struggling to cope. So we are asking, how can India tackle this water crisis? According to the Indian government think tank Niti Aayog, nearly 600 million people in India face water woes each day. That's almost half of the country's population. And 200,000 people die every year because they have no access to clean water. But are efforts being made to improve the situation and what more needs to be done? To talk all about it, we have Aditi Mukherjee, who's uh, part of International Water Management Institute. Welcome, Aditi. Are people more aware of the environmental issues in India now than they were earlier? Yes, I believe so. With, with like droughts following floods, I think water and issues of water, air pollution are on the news constantly. So I believe people are more aware than before. All right. We also have Jyoti, who's working on recharging water tables, especially in cities, through rain harvesting solutions. Welcome, Jyoti. And I know you have a water mantra right at the start of the program. What is it? The five R's of water. Reduce, reuse, recharge, recycle, and most important, respect water. Absolutely. Respect water because that's the lifeline and we talk all about it on the show today. And we have Arun Krishnamurthy who actually gave up a very cushy corporate job to be part of Environmentalist Foundation of India, which revives water bodies in southern India. Arun, from your heart, which has been more satisfying, the money or the clean water that you provide to many? Working for India's environment any day. Absolutely, isn't it? But I want to ask you, Arun, that after so much effort that yeah. you have done in reviving water bodies in Chennai as well, we're seeing one of the worst situation of water crisis. Can you tell us, you are coming from that city right now, what's the situation? Uh, it is uh, an extreme desperate situation, no doubt. Uh, the monsoons have failed uh, last year which, uh, because of which a dynamic industrial hub, which is an economic hub, is definitely mm. facing a uh, major, major water crisis. No doubt but also something which we need to understand the uh, pressure on groundwater reserves is immense because of which we've arrived at this point in time at this point right also the fact that this has been in the making for the last two three decades now and definitely the corrective measures have also started in the last five six years but it's not enough and we we need to do so much more and we're running out of time. Were you given warnings when the water crisis was there like definitely. Cape Town where people were counting down to day zero, that's when they will not have any water, uh, 90 days before that and conservation efforts continued? The media's attention to Chennai's water crisis has been uh, in the recent past. Mm -hmm. But Chennai citizens and their reactions to Chennai's water crisis mm -hmm. has been for over 20 months. So it's not that something we've suddenly woken up. Uh, the media is talking about it now, yes, no doubt. But Chennai citizens, yes, had And still on. we saw the, this large crisis, Aditi. And Chennai is actually on a, in a coastal area. It's next to India's largest natural uh, beach Marina Beach. It has 300 plus lakes. It has 600 plus ponds. It has an urban marshland. Why is it that nothing was done to resolve this crisis before reaching at a point where residents have to struggle for drinking water as well? So while uh, my um, the point I would like to make is that the situation of Chennai is extreme right now. But what has happened across major cities in all parts of India mm. is the land use is such that these wetlands, these ponds, these natural river bodies have been encroached almost everywhere in name of real estate. And that is what has actually intensified the problem because those bodies are also the places where groundwater gets recharged. Mm -hmm. So we have kind of removed a natural source of water which purifies water, which recharges water. And what we 
we are seeing in Chennai is actually symptomatic of many other Indian cities. So would you say it's a man-made crisis? Because there are three rivers uh, in the city which are now dry, and uh, there has been a monsoon deficiency, which Arun pointed out, but is it a man-made crisis as well as you pointed out? Uh, there has been encroachment on the land. Yes, Arun? So it is a man-made crisis in more ways than one, but there have also been man-made solutions which we're going to d discuss. But then largely we're looking at a dynamic city, right, With uh, which is a growing city, mm. and uh, there is need, see, it's a global hub for export, of many kinds. Water is not just being used for drinking, water has an industrial use in the city. Mm -hmm. And have we replenished the ground below as much as we have taken from the ground below? No, that's where the problem and is. And what's happening in the other cities, Jyoti, because we are sitting in the national capital and you actually are in a residential area where you paid premium to get a house, but there was no water for the longest time. So like Aditi uh, said just now, the situation is to a uh, larger or a lesser extent the same in many parts of the country. And the reasons are also what they've just pointed mm -hmm. out. We're just not managing our water properly. That is the, that is the problem. We, did a, a, we made a water balance sheet for six of the biggest cities of the country. So like, you know, we listed down the uh, water, available water supplies, which included the rainwater that an area that the city gets its existing recycle, uh, recycling, water recycling capacity and uh, its share of any river water sharing agreement, existing share. And on the mm. uh, uh, other side, we listed down its water needs. And what we found is that in none of those cities, including Chennai, Chennai yeah. was there any need whatsoever of any extra water at really? all. Really? Yes. yes. Really? So tell me something, when you also see that there are residential colonies which are 25 storied and above, which are constructed around Delhi, most of them are drawing water from the ground because there are reservoirs, as you pointed out. There is water, but why is it not reaching homes? Well, I wouldn't say it's not reaching all homes. I would say there's a lot of inequity in how the water is mm. being distributed. So you have certain pockets which have more water than they can handle and other pockets where it doesn't reach. And the reasons for that is partly uh, topographical, you know, how the mm. topography of the uh, city is. And uh, um, another reason is that majority of our cities are 50% um, or more unplanned. Mm. And so what happens is that those are unauthorized constructions with, for whom water planning has not been done before the constructions came up. So it's a patchwork solution. And most of our homes, yes, Aditi, most of our homes, don't they use a water pump to take out water from the ground as well? Because there are unplanned uh, cities uh, in which there are houses which don't have a water piped connection. Uh, before I come to you, Aditi, I want to actually take our viewers through uh, what uh, Jyoti said and an important point of inequitable distribution of water. While access to water is an issue, the other big problem also is of clean water. Most of us still can't drink water directly from the tap in our homes and the urban poor are the worst off. I went to a slum area, which is just 20 minutes from where I'm sitting right now in our Delhi studio to check out what is the situation like there. I'm outside a congested slum in Delhi and the air here is full of stench of decaying water. And still there are residents here who've been standing for two hours and which is almost a daily routine for them. There are women and children who have come here with a plastic bucket to get their fill of clean drinking water. This water is supplied by a government tanker, free of cost every day. But there is a huge rush, especially during peak summer season, where they need more drinking water. Some of them do have piped water line at their home. And this is what they told me when I asked them, why do they still come here to carry at least 20 litres of water with them every day? The water we get through the pipeline is very dirty and it smells. So how can I use it? How can I cook with it? I come here daily at 5 in the morning. Sometimes I get water, sometimes not. I have two buckets today and I didn't get water. I only fill one bucket, be it 20 or 30 litres, depending on how much I can carry. We try and save water. Our family tries to have a bath with just one bucket of water. Aditi, this is a stark wake-up call because I actually saw children as young as 10 carrying these big buckets of water with them. Some of them even miss their school because they have to have drinking water at 
home. Why is it that India has not been able to provide water for all? And has it become privileged of only a few? That's a very good question. And you know, to follow up what Jyoti was saying, that water does flow based on the slope, but very paradoxically, mm -hmm. water also flows where the wealth is. So the richer colonies on the whole would have better water access, and the richer might be even paying lesser for water than some of the poorer colonies that mm -hmm. we were just in there. Because for them, even if water is free, just the transaction cost of getting water is so high. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think this is one of the saddest part of our system, that the poor have not had equitable access to water. And Arun, what's happening in rural India? Because is the situation worse there. Uh, most of our population is engaged in the agricultural economy. Many of them are dependent on monsoon for their crops. And also now, farmers have been drawing water yeah. from the ground. There are places like the northern state of Punjab True. where water table has actually gone down as much as by over 150 percent over the years. Southwestern India has a city called Shimoga and around Shimoga or the central India where there's a village called Kinhi Gadegaon near Nagpur, 100 kilometers east of Nagpur. In both these places, if you visit, all farmers are tapping into groundwater reserves and they have extremely water intensive crops. Water literacy is what we are lacking at this point in time, despite the technological advances. The water literacy is what is going to help us get through this. Rural India mm. is at a major, major water distress, no doubt. At the same time, we are also having water practices which are not sustainable. Yes, Aditi, you have a point to make because I've seen in uh, areas uh, where farmers are given an option, they would grow a crop where obviously they'll get more money. Now, this, this could be a paddy or sugarcane in northern uh, state yeah. of Punjab, and they would choose that because that gives more money, but that also means more water which the region can't sustain. Why are policymakers not being able to come up with solutions? So I think here I would differ a bit with Arun and say it's not so much of a question of uh, water illiteracy or not knowing how to do water, mm. use water best. It's not as if farmers want to over extract groundwater. They don't want to do that because it also jeopardizes their longer mm. future. But farmers are only reacting to certain incentives and the incentives for say food procurement is such that, that when you grow rice and paddy in very arid Punjab, you get actually quite good price. Yes. And you have very less incentives to grow less water consuming crops like sorghum and millet, which are also more nutritious crops because there is no procurement for those. So mm. basically what I'm trying to say that water cannot be looked at is isolation. What we do with water is very intricately linked with our food policy and with our energy policy. Absolutely. And Jyoti, actually you have found a solution because your organization has been working in rural India. Tell us about it. So one of the problems with water has been that our focus has been entirely supply side. Mm -hmm. So we've been focusing on ensuring supply of water, augmenting supply of water, but, the, but in a country like India, where you have 4% of the world's uh, water resources and 18% of the population, yes. unless you do demand management, there's no way you can uh, create an equilibrium. So we're working on reducing uh, water use in agriculture, increasing water efficiency in agriculture, through, and there are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, Tell us one. OK. So um, one is simply using field management techniques where you grow the same crop. So you'd be surprised to know that you can actually grow rice in Punjab without flood irrigation. Mm -hmm. You would end up saying, saving almost 90% water. You would do that very differently from how it's doing, uh, being done right now. So rice is not the culprit. The way we grow rice is the culprit. And that's an interesting point when you said that water management has to start at an individual level. Uh, Arun, we do know that you've been working in the area of reviving water bodies. But when it comes to you, that glass of water that is right next to you, if you have to save that glass of water every day, just this much of water, what do you do? Simple as this, how much of water do I use for what purpose? Am mm -hmm. I using fresh water to flush down my toilet? And what is the kind of water I've used for what purpose and how do I reuse is what we've learned in Chennai in the last two years, right? Also the fact, where is my water coming from? Am I getting my water through tankers which are sucking bore wells in a farm uh, close by dry and then supplying me that water? No. So these are, again, self-educating uh, uh, myself about my water and then my usage. 
and then associating myself with water bodies in my neighborhood a lake or a pond or a river and my impact on that is what is the first thing to well do. aditi you mentioned in the beginning that you've seen there is more awareness about environment is there also more awareness about water conservation or are people still saying it's not a problem you know i turn on the tap i get my water it is not my problem it is somebody else to deal with perhaps a little bit of both if you come to rural india while there are technologies available that can presumably reduce your water use though i'm i'm kind of doubtful about that because of the mm -hmm. experience because the moment you reduce your water use a farmer in karnataka uses less water and then what all that they do is they bring in more land under irrigation that is in southern india yeah so what i'm trying to say is that uh, give, giving everything back to the individual responsibility does not quite work unless you have the right policy yeah. environment so saving water when you are getting free electricity to pump that water does not somehow make sense and that's a disparity for many of our audience in india that uh, there is a huge subsidy given to the uh, agricultural belt to farmers because we need more crop production uh, of uh, electricity being subsidized water being subsidized in cities also we've seen water being subsidized and is that part of a problem jyoti because do we actually waste water because we pay so less for it uh, or should india go towards a model like singapore where you can use water to a certain limit beyond that you pay a premium so people conserve water well i have mixed views on that mm -hmm. i would say that water is a basic human right and uh, pricing it according to its economic value is not really a solution that has worked anywhere in the world singapore included and so the um, i would like uh, you know the delhi experiment delhi recently did a very good experiment where what they did was that they set a certain limit 25000 liters per month for a family was to be given free of cost now that is very counter intuitive and i certainly reacted negatively to it but over the years what i've seen has happened is that people have become conscious of trying to keep their water consumption within that limit they've voluntarily asked for meters so they could monitor that their uh, water usage and 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 take the subsidy for it so it could actually work free water does not necessarily have to be and i don't just just simplifying it a little bit more because we've seen in um, cities like cape town where yeah. uh, water was getting depleted there was an entire culture around saving water so you could wear a dirty shirt to office and there were some offices saying that we'll see who can wear the dirtier shirt for the longest time to save water at that time you had uh, uh, urinals which were uh, the technology water. was used that you didn't have water in those urinals and you can flush it down without a water and keep it clean as well there were a greater emphasis on reusing water that you use for cooking to uh, perhaps uh, use them for your lawn there was another incentive for 90 second showers i don't know how they did that but there was a 90 second showers uh, in chennai where you are seeing a water crisis are people taking out these steps are they majorly aware? majorly there What is are they doing? Uh, first there's a campaign which is running in chennai called back to earth mm -hmm. where we're trying to break the concrete floors to let the first showers first drops of rains to get into the ground below and not just run off into our storm water drains that's being done second a lot of the storm water drains in chennai are getting dug wells so that more rain water can be conserved chennai is a pioneer when it comes to rain water harvesting in india that is again being revived mm -hmm. and then now for the first time in many many years there is a government civic society collaboration to revive several fresh water habitats in chennai a lot is happening and this is not just happening in the last one month this has been happening since 2015 so are there solutions then um, aditi that india is also providing to the world because you've actually worked in the mountainous region in the northern part of india in the himalayan region where one of your studies indicated is running out of the glacial water bodies um because of climate change and you've been able to revive water tables in set serve several villages which are in the mountainous region as well so are the solutions which are being adopted from india by the world so i think uh, some of the solutions that arun was talking about are nature based solutions we have to really move away from very engineering very infrastructure yes. based big solutions mm -hmm. to more nature based solutions because again climate change is very very real we are not talking of 20 or 30 years down the mm -hmm. line mm -hmm. if you look at the latest yes. 1.5 yes. degree report it's like it's like a real issue now yes. so the work in the himalayas was about reviving springs which we use simple science not very complicated science and lot of community action and 
and community knowledge to revive these springs and it worked and this was where India was the pioneer states of Sikkim then many of the NGOs have worked on it and countries like Nepal and all the Hindu Kush Himalayan hmm. countries were very very interested. So you basically dug a trench around the areas and mapped out where the water pockets are so that they can recharge. But I want to take you to the point of another plan that the government is now hoping could set another global standard in India. That's about interlinking of rivers, which talks about taking water from the zone which has excessive monsoon because of climate vagaries and floods and take it to a drought prone area. Now, this plan has been in the works as one of the major ambitious projects of the newly constituted Ministry for Water. What are your thoughts on it? So my thoughts on it are mixed. It's not as if there are no parts of the world where water transfer hasn't worked. There are examples of successful water transfers in the past, but more and more the entire world is looking at more of nature-based solutions and more local solutions because what has happened historically is that these have had a lot of spillover negative mm. effects, mm. environmental effects as well as social effects. So what I would say that it would, should be possible to do it in case-by-case -case basis, but it should All not right. be the one Ar solution. Arun has a point to make. Arun, go ahead. Tra what Water transfer, water transport is already being done in many parts of India, but that doesn't have to be done only through interlinking rivers. It's a very human centric approach. Rivers behave differently and they are different ecologies. There are several life forms in each different rivers. We just can't have an engineering solution of linking two rivers and killing all life forms. So there are uh, challenges. Jyoti, go ahead. You have something so, to say on this. I would say we should learn from other countries. So Netherlands, for example, has set a very good example of something that they call room for the river. Hmm. So th they're going, they're, they're actually going back to a situation where they're living, leaving space for the river to live out its life cycle for tidal, um, you know, tidal uh, right. r r changes. And so they're leaving space for the river. We're in a country where in the monsoons our rivers swell up. Yeah. Hmm. And instead of leaving the floodplains for the river to swell up and recharge our aquifers, mm. we're building on the floodplain. So maybe another solution could actually be just go back to where we started from. Well, what, what, what do you think about the other policy, which is about piped water to all the households by 2024? That's another ambitious project. The question is, uh, the infrastructure is what is being focused on. But the reality on the ground of water being depleted, do you think that there is a mismatch? So, well, one, I think it's needed. Two, I have no doubts at all that they'll do it. Three, the challenge is actually the sustainability and the quality of water that will be supplied. Absolutely. Arun, you had something to say on this. Uh, who's tapping into the ground reserve definitely mm. needs to be regulated. And there's no better authority than the government in a democracy like mm. ours to regulate that and provide clean drinking water, which is a fundamental right, which we've all agreed over the time. Mm. Our freshwater bodies cannot be converted into dumping sites of trash and more. They have to be given their natural space where they can reach out the ground below. Only when that is done, the piped water to every home will become a reality. And Aditi, I want to come to you for this question because what could be the technological solutions then? We have seen that countries like Israel have uh, developed desalination plants, taking water from the sea and using it uh, and using and treating it for drinking water. You do also have drip irrigation system that's being used to conserve water during agriculture. Why is it that India is still not being able to tap into it completely? I think the technology that you use should also depend on your own socioeconomic conditions. So what Israel spends on just managing his water is more than the entire budget of our water ministry or, you know, all put together. So we have to look at technology in comparison of what we have. Having said that, Chennai, I believe, is doing desalinization. It still remains one of the mm. more expensive mm. options. Mm. And then uh, wearing a scientist hat, things are often not as simple as it seems. So micro-irrigation, let's come to that. I mean, I have worked in a lot of yes. cases looking yes. at micro-irrigation. Say in Karnataka, micro-irrigation was adopted. And the, immediately what happened, farmer used to keep a certain field fallow. And the moment that they save some water, they actually expand their irrigated okay. area. So adoption of technology did not translate into saving water. Mm. So mm. technology is kind of, you know, one of the one of the many threads yeah. that yeah. you need to use. I'm afraid I'm out of time. But thank you so much for this engaging discussion, because uh, as Benjamin Franklin once said, when the well is dry, we know the worth of water. Many Indian cities are realizing this the hard way. From this discussion, it is clear that policies alone 
will not work, the change must start with you and me. Do tweet with hashtag WorkLifeIndia. Thank you for being with us.